Good morning, everyone. It is beautiful in Florida today. And we're going to let the audience build for just a moment. And then I'm going to talk about the four things that are killing your relationship and how to do something about them today, how to make your life better, how to improve your relationships, and how to stand in a place of gratitude for those people in your life that are there to love you and that you're loving. By the way, I am sweating like a hooker in church. Hey, Lauren, nice to see you. It is so warm out here today. So, Lauren, we need to go grab a cup of coffee or something. By the way, that video you posted was absolutely beautiful with your sweet baby Dahlia. So, hey, David, nice to see you. Every, who else? Hi, Jeffrey, how are you, brother? Nice to see you. We need to grab a cup of coffee one of these days and figure out something good in the world. Your artwork, by the way, is looking fantastic. Really, really cool. Uh, so all is well, my friends, all is well. So in about one and a half minutes, I'm going to talk about the four things that are killing your relationships. And uh, both not only with your relationship with others, but also your relationship with yourself. And, you know, here's the bottom line. If you can't love yourself, you can't love someone else. So part of the process of this 14-day journey with me is to teach you how to improve your outside relationships, but more importantly, how to improve your inside relationship, how to nurture and love yourself in a way that allows you to share love with other people more boldly, more beautifully, and more brilliantly. So that is the plan. And by the way, if I'm wiping the sweat off my brow today, just forgive me because uh, all these storms, hi Alex, nice to see you, all these storms coming in and you know, we need to say a big prayer for our folks our friends on the eastern seaboard, but that's causing humidity. I think the humidity in, in Florida today is probably about 197%. Literally feels like you just walked out of the shower. So, okay, so we're going to begin, and I'm really glad you guys are with me today. So I want to tell you a story of a couple that I worked with, and in fact, I've, I've seen this with many, many couples that I've worked with, but uh, about seven years ago, I sat with a couple of guys that had been in a relationship for a couple of years, and uh, they were fighting and struggling, and there was always some type of little battle, and they w seemed to be on a downhill slide, which is not uncommon for so many people. And so as we sat together, I said, I would like you to give me a, a clear-cut example, understanding of how you expect the other person to show up. And then I gave them an assignment. Hi, Hende, nice to see you. I gave them a, an assignment. I said, I want you each to go in a separate room. I want you to spend 20 minutes, and I want you to write down how you want your partner to show up in the context of your relationship. So both these fellows went on their separate ways. And then 30 minutes later, we got together back in the living room, and I looked at one of the partners, and I said, okay, David, tell me... Uh, what your expectations are for Jeffrey, you know? And he had a list of about five things. Be honest, communicate, love me as, as well as you possibly can, uh, eat with me when we can, and do adventures. And then I looked at the other guy and I said, okay, tell me what your things are on your piece of paper. And he said, well, I want him to read the paper with me every Sunday, be involved in politics, understand uh, science, take good care of his body, uh, eat meals, cook every Wednesday and Friday, uh, go on four or five adventures, travel, read, etc., etc., etc. There was a list of 152 expectations. And I looked at both of these fellows and I said, here's the thing, fellas, you guys are not going to win at this battle because you're bringing to the table a whole list of rules. And so, Without a doubt, the thing that kills your relationship more than anything across the board, and I'm going to drill this today, is the rules that you hold. All those things that you believe are important that keep you safe in the world. Now, let me tell you where those rules come from, okay? When you were a young child, you uh, had to learn how to function in the world, just like my pet baby squirrel Jasper. I'm teaching him every day how to live in the world. So we'll go out and do little things, and I uh, grab him if he gets too far or if he gets in a bind, I pick him up, uh, just like our parents did to us. They're always telling us about how we're supposed to act and what we're supposed to do and how we keep ourselves safe. I'll give you an example. When I was about five years old, no, I was probably younger than that, four years old, my mother and I were walking along a, a side road. We lived in the country, and we were walking along a side road, 
and I noticed that there was something out in front of us that looked like something fun to play with. Hey, Carol. Carolyn, nice to see you. And so I took off in a mad dash to pick up what I thought was a rope. And my mom took out after me. And, you know, there are cars flying by and this and that. And uh, I, I was just about to reach down and she screamed, don't! She, she was on the top of her lungs screaming at me. And uh, then all of a sudden the rope that I was about to pick up moved. And it was a very large snake. Well, at the same time, my mom grabbed me up by the arm, pulled me out of the street, and stood there saying, Never run away from me. You've always got to be safe. Don't ever walk out in front of cars. Don't ever pick up things you shouldn't. You could have died. And I was traumatized. And the weird part is that I was just trying to have some fun. And so at that moment, I developed a whole set of rules about how you walk on the street, uh, how you interact with the natural world. I, just a list of rules, rules, rules all designed to keep me safe. And I understand that as parents, we have to do that for our children, but as adults, sometimes, no, not sometimes, all the time, the rules that you have that you learned in childhood, all the stories you tell yourself, the narratives that you hold, come from the people that influenced you, and the sole intention of all these rules were, are, to keep you safe in the world. Well, guess what? You are safe in the world because you're a grown adult. You know how to make good decisions. You can be rational and thoughtful. And so the first thing I want you to write down is that the rules in your relationship, the rules about how you see yourself in the world, are what is influencing your relationship. Because the more rules we have, the less the other person can show up in their full authenticity, their full truth. When you have a whole list of rules, what you're essentially doing is saying to the other person or people in your life that this is how you're, they're supposed to interact with you. And if they can't do that, then they can't have a relationship with you. That's kind of crazy because there's nothing unconditional about that. And what's even more alarming is that what that does for your relationship is it just creates a bunch of clones. You know, have you ever noticed people that have been together for a long, long time? They say the same things. They like the same things. They act the same way. They dress the same way. Their pets even look like them. And I think that's beautiful to some degree, but I also think it's very, very sad because those are two individual souls on a dynamic, soulful journey. And somewhere along the way, the rules of conformity began to influence how they showed up in the world. So the first thing I want you to think about is what rules do you have for your spouse or partner? What rules do you hold for your kids? What rules do you have for how you expect your friends to treat you or what you're supposed to do for fun? And what rules do you hold for yourself about how you're supposed to show up in the world, interact with other people, see yourself, be productive, uh, have fun, all those rules. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you want to really get down to uh, a pile of rules, what I want you to do is take a sub, sub dive. I want you to look more deeply at three specific things. They are all the conditions you hold for other people. So it is a condition to say, um, if you ever lie to me, I will leave you. That's a condition. If you ever commit an act of infidelity, I will leave you. Look for your hardline conditions. Because when you look at your hardline conditions, then you'll see your softline conditions. Now, let me add a caveat. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have expectations or rules or conditions in your relationship. What I am saying that is that you should have mutual standards in your relationship, not conditions, okay? So the first thing I want you to really think about is what are the rules that you have in your life? Second thing is what conditions do you hold for other people? If someone is late for an appointment, that is a condition. You say they should be on time. If someone doesn't make their bed, messy bed, messy head, that's a condition. So make your bed every day. Load the dishwasher a certain way. Put your clothes up after school. Uh, pack your backpack. Unpack your backpack. Uh, sort out the towels a certain way. We were standing in the laundry room one day, and Eric and I just had a knockdown drag out because I mixed the wrong towels in the washing machine. Well, here's the dumbass situation we had going on right there. All those things are going to get washed, and it really didn't matter if a, a pink towel was with a white towel. They were all old towels, and it really didn't matter. But that was a condition that he held. A condition 
that we hold for someone else is also a reflection of a condition we hold for ourselves. So if I have an expectation for someone to load the dishwasher a certain way, I hold the same condition, okay? Here's the third thing I want you to think about. What judgments do you hold about other people? Judgments about how they live, how they think, what they believe, where they go, how they interact with others, judgments about how they take care of themselves or not take care of themselves, judgments about the way people appear, the way they dress, the way they interact with others, judgment about humor, judgment about language. I'll give you an example. Yesterday I was having a, a conference call with a woman and uh, in the process I dropped the F-bomb because I think it's a very utilitarian word when used appropriately. And she stopped and she said, why do you have to have such profane language? And I said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. That was a judgment that she was holding. And for some reason, she chose to become offended by my language, when in fact my language has no bearing on her whatsoever. She's attaching a meaning to that language. That's a judgment. So I want you to really drill down and ask yourself, what judgments do I hold for other people? And remember, the judgments that you hold for others are a direct reflection of your own self-imposed judgments. Now, the fourth thing is what expectations do you have for others? The expectation to have fun, the expectations around sex, the expectations around health, the expectations around communication, the expectations around playfulness, the expectations around parenting, expectations around lawn maintenance, home care, uh, cars, expectations about how people show up uh, in the world, expectations for how people are to hold your emotions or listen to you, expectations everywhere. So let me tie a bow on this. All the rules that you hold in your life, all the conditions, the judgments, the expectations that you have come from your fears. They are derivative of your wounds. And if you want to know more about that, then I'm happy to provide you some information that will really help you understand that at UpsizeYourSoul.com. Nevertheless, here's the overlay. And now I'm going to pull out the big mallet and get you really thinking about what's going on. You know, when we're in the context of relationships with other people, we're looking outside of ourselves for certain things. We're looking for stability, connection, intimacy, romance, communication, identity, uh, personality, uh, assurance. We're always looking outside of ourselves to shore up what resides inside of ourselves. We're looking to the outside world to make us happy. We're looking to other people and situations to give us joy. And I want you to really take a deep drill right now and ask yourself, what makes you happy? And if what makes you happy is outside of you, happy from another person, happy because of a situation, happy because of an adventure, happy because of a job, happy because of some something outside of your sphere of influence, if it, if it moves outside of your own soul, hey, Melissa, nice to see you then that is what's called an externalized locus of control. And by the way, here's the bottom line with that. If you're looking anywhere outside of you, hi, Jim Clark, hello, and how is Paris? If you're looking anywhere outside of you for happiness, looking to a partner to give you fulfillment and wholeness, looking to a job to give you a sense of identity and purpose, looking to your religion or spirituality to give you assurance in the world, looking to music, whatever it may be, if you're looking outside of yourself, you're denying what's inside. And what's inside is a divine resource, a direct connection, to the cosmic creator and a great embedded sense of intuition, self-awareness, and personal drive. You have everything inside of you to live a beautiful, peaceful, joyful, happy life. But here's the zinger. Here's the zinger. If you want to do a test to determine whether or not you have an internalized locus of control, you're the master of your own ship, you're the captain of your destiny, 
and that's how you create happiness. Or if you want to understand whether or not you have an externalized locus of control, simply sit one day alone for three or four or five or six or seven hours. Putz around the house, write, read, go to the beach, whatever you need to do, but be fully alone. And when you're fully alone, be aware of the emotions and thoughts that rise up. If you have feelings around loneliness, if you are concerned about being isolated, if you have pressures about what you should be doing, you're allowing an externalized locus of control. To be a fully unconditional person, you must get really right with feeling really good about who you are completely alone. Now, let me drill that even a step deeper. We live with an illusion. It's an illusion that we're on the journey together. Now, let me be clear. We are all on a journey together, essentially, but we are all on our own independent journeys. So we're not in one big journey. We're not in one big boat all traveling together on, on the same river. We're in three billion little boats and all on different rivers. And so if you're looking to journey with other people, you're looking for outside assurance, if you're uh, seeking happiness outside of you, you're living an illusion. So if you get really acquainted with this idea that you are alone on the journey, who's with you? Well, that's a spiritual question, my friends. Who's with you is however you connect to the core consciousness, the universal divine, the master creator, your God. It's a spiritual issue. And, you know, uh, through the dawn of, of ages, the great philosophers have written about man's search for meaning and how we are alone on the journey and how we're seeking to understand our souls deliberately. And as I mentioned yesterday, that is our journey. Our journey is, an, is a journey of aloneness, bumping up against other people, interacting, enjoying, experiencing, and ultimately connecting to the divine that resides within us, and then celebrating the divine in others. So if you want to build a really great unconditional relationship, I would invite you to think about all the rules, all the judgments, all the expectations, and free yourself from that fear. And step into a place where you feel really good about being alone and learn how to love yourself. I gotta give you an example of that. Hi, Emily. <coughs> I've struggled with self-esteem issues for years. I don't any longer. Oh, okay. every now and then it'll crop up. But when, uh, you know, I, I used to look in the mirror and I would see 78 things that were bad and I would judge myself and be critical and I always have an expectation about how I should improve or what I should do or how I should dress or how I should ah made me crazy and so about four years ago I did a, an exercise with myself I have a studio usually wherever I live and I paint in that studio and in the studio, I always place mirrors around the room so I can get different perspectives on the lighting and the angle of the, the painting that I'm working on. But it also gives me the opportunity to watch myself in action. And I do that because my art is an expression of creativity that comes from the universal divine. So it, when I am in my studio, it's like going to church for me. Anyway, I have all these mirrors around the room. I write notes on them. I'm watching myself. And so one night I was feeling exceptionally down about who I am. In effect, what I was doing was telling, telling my God to fuck off that he made a mistake or she made a mistake or it made a mistake, which is really so ridiculous. Have you thought about that? When you're self-critical, you're telling the master creator that they made a mistake. It's really kind of sad. So as I stood in front of the mirror, I took my shirt off. And I then started listening to the stories that were cropping up. Oh my God, you got to get rid of that beer gut. That's not a beer gut. That's a whole fucking keg. Oh my gosh, you need to, to uh, get a tan. Your arms are too skinny. Your shoulders are too slumped. Uh, why can't you, you know, I mean, it just went on and on and on and on. Then I put my shirt back on. The next night I went in, took my shirt off, and I took my pants off. And I stood there and I did the same exercise. And I had the whole litany of different things that I could just beat the hell out of myself about. And then I decided the third day, 
but I would strip down buck naked and stand in that mirror until I could find one thing that I appreciated. And believe me, I think I stood there for about 17 hours. But there came a point where I finally began to say, well, you know what, you're not that bad. And then after a few more days, I began to say, you know what, you're not that bad. Actually, there are some things that are kind of cool about you. And then so on and so on and so on until the final day, that I was standing in front of the mirror, completely buck naked. It's not a sexual thing at all, it's an awareness thing. And I simply looked in the mirror and I said, you are perfect. Now that's not ego driven. That's because I realized that every one of us, however you wanna judge yourself, fat, tall, skinny, thin, black, white, uh, tan, untan, overweight, exercise, toned, it does not matter because we are all universally beautiful creatures. One day I was walking through the Denver airport and I used to be a judgmental bitch, frankly. I could judge you about everything from your shoes to the way that your hair was cut. And one day in the Denver airport I said, stop doing that, Trey. And I was on that little rolling sidewalk and I began to look at every person and instead of finding something to be critical about, I began to find and look for something that I could celebrate. Oh, she has a lovely purple shirt on. He's got a wonderful haircut. I wonder what he does in the world. I like the look on his face. Those glasses are pretty cool. Boy, she can really run down that path pretty quickly. And when you stand in a place of appreciation of other people, then you can begin to start appreciating yourself. Hi, Jeff. Nice to see you. So, your assignment today is to go to the mall and do some drive-by smiling. Here's how you do that. Now go get yourself one of those big ass cookies at the, at the you know, it's about a 12,000 calorie cookie, right? Get yourself that and a soda pop. No, not really, but if you want to, it'd be good. And then find a table, and as you sit there, watch the people passing you. You can do it at a Starbucks, you can do it anywhere you want. Watch the people, people passing you. And as they are approaching and passing, I want you to say to yourself, what am I thinking and saying about those people in my head? And as you're doing that, become very aware of all the conditions and judgments and expectations that you hold. Because remember, they're a reflection of your own self-imposed conditions, judgments, and expectations. And then, when you can finally release that stuff, I want you to sit there. Now, by this time, you're going to be on a, a cracked up sugar high, so it might be difficult to sit there. But, I want you to practice drive-by smiling. And as somebody walks by, I want you to simply do this and smile at them. I want you just to acknowledge their essence as other human, as a human being. Celebrate that they're sharing air with you. And I'll tell you what, that will change your heart faster than anything you've ever seen doing some drive-by smiling. And they'll look at you like you've lost your mind and you can just chuckle because you know that you've released some type of judgment that you were holding about yourself because you can hold them in reverence as a creation of God. Okay? Now, Conditions, judgments, expectations, we've all got a foundation for that. Here's what I want to do is offer uh, four things to do instead of those things, okay? In your relationships, develop mutual standards and communication patterns. Mutual standards and communication patterns. If you say, I don't ever want you to, to screw around on me, that's a mutual standard. Can we both commit to that? If both partners can commit to it, then it's a mutual standard and not an expectation. Communication. Now, I'm not saying you have to communicate the same way. What I am saying is learn how to have established communication systems that work. If you live with a grunter, then maybe have a cup of coffee once a week and just debrief the week and touch base and get connected in some way. Okay, so mutual standards and communication. Number two, I want you to move yourself to a place where you, you live your life with acceptance and allowing, especially in your partnerships, in your friendships, how can you accept that person fully? In order to do that, you've got to free yourself from the conditions and the judgments and the expectations. And how can you allow that person? Allowing is a beautiful concept because when you allow others to be in their essence, essentially you're allowing them to show up as they are. You know, I have one rule for my relationships. I want you just to show up as well as you possibly can. And if you're in your wounds, we'll walk through those wounds. Don't spew them on me. 
own your shit, and allow me to be my full essence. Think about the people that break you down, diminish your light, make you feel small. They're not allowing you to live in your essence. Here's the third thing. I want you to live in expectancy. Expectancy is this concept, not expectation. Expectancy is about saying, I'm going to live in the world today. I'm going to interact with others today. And I'm going to know that everything is working out beautifully. I have an expectancy for joy. Expectancy for hope. Expectancy for beauty. And when you live in that place, you start to celebrate people differently. And lastly, I want you to, you know, when I was in graduate school, you always have clients that are difficult to work with. And uh, not always, but, you know, when you're act or interacting with different people, there's always something that's going to uh, push a button somewhere until you get to a point where that no longer exists. But I had a, a college professor that used to say, if you don't like a client, find one thing you can appreciate. Just one thing. And if you are in the throes of hostility with your spouse or partner or a friend or whatever, I want you to reground in appreciation. Appreciate the journey they've been on with you. Appreciate their growth. Appreciate the way that they brush their teeth. Appreciate anything you can find. Find one element of appreciation. So, mutual standards and communication. Acceptance and allowing. Expectancy and appreciation. Now, to tie a bow around all of this, you can live all of this out if you live in a state of gratitude. In the present moment, right here. Not thinking about yesterday, not thinking about what happened in the past. You're savoring the now. And I want you to savor the now by breathing deeply, by being aware, by standing in a place of creative curiosity, by being open to receive. Because remember, you're a transmitter. Great things flow to you and through you. You're a receiver, a transmitter. Great things flow to me and through me. Now, I'm going to give you a final assignment. If you want to really move yourself along this path, there are two parts to this. Put your, put your contact information in a private message to me, an email or whatever, and I'll send you a, a handout with lots and lots of questions that you can use to dive into your soul more deeply. The second part of the assignment is today I want you to take, or whenever you can, I want you to take a personal day, and I want you to be alone and notice yourself. Be aware of who you are. Be aware of the thoughts that come in and flow out. Think about the relationships that you're in right now, and I bet if you drill it down, you'll see that you're operating from that core set of rules, conditions, judgments, and expectations. I stand in gratitude to each one of you. Thank you for watching and hanging out with me today. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about some more cool stuff, but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet because I want you to tune in. Share the video if you'd like to, and be well, my friends. You are a divinely inspired, beautiful expression of something so much bigger and brilliant than we can ever imagine. Be well, friends.